India is looking for about 50 gigawatts of battery manufacturing capacity. And the government has committed 38,000 crores through the PLI scheme. Mm -hmm. And they recently awarded 18,000 crores or so to three advanced cell chemistry battery manufacturers. Um, would you like to guess which, which three? I have no idea. Yeah. Which so, well, just... Just as a heads up, neither Excite nor Amaraj are, are in that. Okay. So uh, that's not good news. That's for them. not at all good news. But the three that are in are Reliance New Energies, unsurprisingly, Ola Electric, okay. and Rajesh Exports. Wow. I'd like to welcome our viewers to the 12th episode of the Indian Market Story. This is the last in a series on the automotive industry that we've been doing. And so far, we've done a podcast on passenger vehicles as well as two wheelers. But now we move on to auto ancillaries, a really interesting bet for any investor, where there's a huge diversity of options, some wealth creators and some wealth destroyers. And uh, once again, we have a returning guest with us, Mr. Deepan Mehta, who's here to break this industry down and try and help investors find the right play to make. So what do you think about the auto ancillary industry, where it's positioned and where it's going? So thank you for having me on the podcast again. And I think auto ancillary is a very interesting industry. And the reason is that it is uh, not dependent on any particular model or any particular trend in the auto industry. And let me explain. Sometimes we find that Hero Motor Corp has got a successful model, then next would be Aisha, TVS. Within the passenger vehicle, new players are coming like Hyundai, like BMW also, Mercedes. So new global players are coming into India and setting up their plants. But we cannot buy those stocks of those unlisted players. The better way to play the Indian auto industry, which is a fantastic opportunity, is also through the auto ancillary because they supply to every single, one of these mm -hmm. companies supply to every single auto ancillary. That is part A. More importantly, India's auto ancillary is so well developed and at such a level that they are in a position to export to global OEMs as well. Mm -hmm. and that's a huge market for Indian auto ancillaries. And in this China plus one strategy, I think auto OEMs are looking for alternate suppliers from India. So I think many positive things going for the auto ancillary industry. And I would say that it is a great opportunity for investors if you get the stock right. But selectivity is the way to play this industry. Absolutely. So very interesting. So China plus one, uh, technological competence and diversification away from you know one brand or one model, I think is... That's I guess right. if I could summarize it, uh, those exactly. are the key drivers for auto ancillaries. So let's maybe look at how auto ancillaries break down. If I understand it correctly, we have you know battery manufacturers like Amaraja and Exide. You have your tire manufacturers like Balkrishna Industries and MRF, um, and then you have like electronics providers like Uno Minda, Motherson Wiring, Sumi, uh, and and several more in the space. And then there's maybe some hard engineering manufacturing companies like Bharat Forge and uh, uh, Bosch. Have I covered the universe or, or set, Absolutely. Set I think you've done it very well. So there are the hard engineering, I would call them the forging companies, or more of it, uh, I would call them the engine parts companies, mm -hmm. which have to be avoided because, you know, we are going more towards EV. Then there are the electronic, electrical type of companies, the ones you named, Sona, BLW, Uno, Minda, Minda Corp. Those are the ones, I think, where the potential is the maximum because they're not dependent on any type of engine. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there are the tires, which are, of course, going everywhere. And then the battery manufacturers, which are where the maximum problem is there for obvious reasons. Of if course. they're going more and more towards EV, then they have, would have challenges going into the future. So I think broadly we've uh, broken up into these, these categories. But uh, the most important uh, aspect or quality I look for in a company is how they have been able to grow the content per vehicle. Mm -hmm. See, because at the end of the day, the auto OEMs also, they want to have a consolidated list of suppliers. They want to work with fewer people. Right. And at the same auto entry supplying them, say, braking systems plus a, a powertrain or something else as well, then it makes it easier for them from point of view of managing the supply chain. Right, of course. And reducing the working capital. Yeah. And I think a really good example of that is actually the Japanese automakers that have th that came up with this whole just-in-time yeah, manufacturing absolutely. concept, <laughs> right? Where, you know, the car manufacturer and the parts manufacturer are sort of right next to each other. And the overall supply chain consumes less working capital uh, to make to make everything a little bit more That's efficient. Okay. And if I may just add that the birth of the Indian auto ancillary coincided with Maruti Suzuki coming mm -hmm. into India. So when Maruti Suzuki tied up and they decided to build the Maruti car for the people, the Maruti 800, Suzuki came with a whole host of 
ancillary companies from Japan as well. Mm -hmm. And they laid the foundation of the auto ancillary industry just now, which is now so well developed and technologically sound and doing their own R&D, offering solutions to the auto OEMs as well, mm -hmm. and in a position to manage huge export markets as well. Right. So do you want to start with uh, the auto ancillaries that are best positioned for the future or the worst position for the future? You start with the best, why not? <laughs> sure. Okay, so let's talk about, I guess, the electronics component manufacturers. Mm -hmm. uh, companies like Sona, Minda, Uno Minda, Motherson's Wiring. Um, is there any winner within that space or any standout within that space you'd like to start with? See, I think Soda BLW is mm -hmm. really an exceptional company uh, because they have positioned themselves as a one-stop supplier for many EVs. I'm not sure, but they supply to Tesla as well in the US, first of all. And uh, they are on top of this entire EV evolution which is taking place. Uh, they have a solid R&D. They have got good technological tie-ups as well. And I think they are uh, giving, they are supplying mission critical components for the EV industry. Right. They have an order book position of almost 24,000 crores, runs into many, many years, and that's also growing. So they are, I think, a tier one supplier for right. every EV, but also they have a fairly large uh, revenue base coming from the regular ICE, that's the mm -hmm. internal combustion engines as well. And I have been tracking this stock for a really long, hoping for an opportunity to buy, but I'm just not able to because, you know, at 70 plus type of price to earnings multiple, a lot of the positives in the prospects and the future growth have been captured. So from a timing point of view, I just want to wait and see how this uh, price yeah. evolves. But it's, a, it's, it's the top pick in terms of quality. Right. I guess maybe just give our viewers a little bit of context on the figures. So over the last five years, their revenues have grown at a compounded rate of 30%. 31%, yes. Yeah. And their profits have also grown at a compounded rate of 18%. It's best in class. Best in class by, by a wide margin. And that really reflects in the 75p, which is very, very expensive. It's the most expensive. It's more expensive than any auto OEM also for that matter. Mm -hmm. But I think for the more um, uh, quality conscious value based investors, you could look at the Minda twins, Minda Corp and Minda Industries, which have been now renamed as Uno Minda. The Minda group was formed by two brothers who split in 2012 and therefore we have these two listed companies as well. And I think they are the real success story within the auto ancillary space and I'll tell you why. Because from day one, they are focusing on products which help the auto OEMs to premiumize their output, right. their, their brands. Mm -hmm. So anything you see in the car, like dashboards, infotainment, security, sensors, alloy wheels, mm -hmm. these are the wiring harness systems. These are the products and assemblies which they have focused on. Mm -hmm. And because of the way new models have come, which have more and more bells and whistles, more and more frills, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are the ones which have really benefited from that particular trend. Right. And they have steadfastly gone ahead and tried to increase the content per vehicle. Right. Which I said earlier, that that's it's the one of the point. key. Yeah. Exactly. And I guess it really plays into our overall uh, evaluation of the auto space. So premiumization is one of the big trends Absolutely. that's driving more and more value for auto companies. That's right. Yeah. And they play right into that particular investment theme. Yeah. And very well managed companies, aggressive I would say decent corporate governance also because Uno Minda had many, many subsidiaries and joint ventures and eventually all of them were merged mm -hmm. at book value into the mother company, giving full benefit to the minority shareholders. That's a really, really positive That's right. step. You know, if you if you merge your subsidiary at book value, uh, you're really respecting the minority shareholders. Absolutely. Which is a which I mean, I guess you can see that, right? Like you see that reflected in um in Uno Minda's figures. I think over the last 17 years they've generated 32% compounded yeah. for their shareholders, which yes. is exceptional. And, and the PE as well of 50 is, is extremely rich. But I guess when you're generating the results, um, it, it's justified to some degree. Absolutely. I think, see, valuations generally in the good quality auto ancillary will be expensive mm -hmm. because investors realize that there's a huge opportunity. Uh, there's disruption taking place. Transportation is a solid uh, industry to be in. And a good way to play without taking any bet on ICE or EVs 
just by the auto ancillary right and something 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 will work for you right but i guess maybe to sort of highlight the differences between minda corp and uno minda mm -hmm. right so uno minda has been growing at 14% compounded with their revenues and their profits have been growing at 18% compounded over the last 5 years but minda corp on the other hand their revenues have only been growing at 7% and profit at 5% over the last 5 years compounded and um, i i mean you you sort of see that reflected in their different pe's i think minda corp is at 24 Uno Minda is, I think, at the aforementioned fifty-one. That's um, a small. See, Minda Corp is a smaller company. Mm -hmm. It's just that we prefer because it's a quality player. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, they are into wiring harnesses. And with the way the two-wheeler EV revolution, which we discussed in the earlier podcast, I think that it's a good play on that particular segment. They supply to Ola Electric and mm -hmm. they supply to Bajaj Autos Chetak. Yeah. So I think that uh, you know, history is one thing, track record is one thing. but i'm pretty certain that both these companies should do pretty well in terms of growth rates going forward so we've covered three companies basically in the uh, auto wiring space. space but there's a big 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 elephant that is madhasan sumi now right. earlier name now it is called madhasan samvardhana madhasan tang twister but nonetheless uh, you know form uh, formed it by the segal family and uh, this is one very interesting story Uh, Varun, which is, I would say, a success story up to a point of time, but has got many risk factors attached to it as well. So, just before we get into this story, just to sort of uh, give viewers some context, because the 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 figures around Samvartana Madhusudan are very very confusing, right? So, their revenues have grown at five percent compounded over the last five years, but profits have fallen by five percent, um, and that's reflected in the share price. So, over the last seventeen years, they've grown at eighteen percent compounded. But over the last five years, they've fallen at about eight percent year on year. Yeah. So it's a very, I mean, almost like a, a tale of two time periods. So what's gone right and then wrong with the company? So it was the darlings of the market uh, until about three, four years ago or so, up to maybe just prior to COVID, I would say. And the reason for that is that they made very successful acquisitions over these large companies, Pegu Farm, Rydell. PKC. I mean, the names uh, may not be known to the viewers, but they made huge acquisitions, and they grew to be one of the. To they grew to be the largest consolidated player in the auto and city industry, right? In terms of market capitalization, also in terms of revenues and profits, and the key uh, DNA of this company was uh, acquisition of troubled assets overseas, turning them around. adding their good quality management to it reducing costs and becoming a preferred supplier to the global auto oems mm -hmm. they did it in europe they did it in us they are manufacturing in china as well so that's been their strategy to buy good quality manufacturing auto ancillary companies merging them and then making sure that they are you know delivering maximum to the customers and to the other stakeholders and that strategy worked really well until about 3 4 years ago or so then we got hit by covid and now we have this massive uh, issues in terms of uh, economy global headwinds mm -hmm. uh, it has impacted global automobile manufacturing numbers as well and that's where i think the company is not able to grow as fast as the other three we spoke about earlier yeah. because it's a play on the entire global auto industry which i think is facing a lot of challenges because of inflation interest rates yeah geopolitical yeah, yeah. events yeah no so that that makes sense i think if if uh, samadhan madhasan is a company that's primarily deriving its revenues from global auto sales uh, i think they're in trouble for a very long time because with rising interest rates and higher interest rates for longer financing of cars globally is going to become a lot more expensive yes good point yeah and uh, that's going to continue to impact sales for a fairly long period of time not to mention the fact that on average car ownership globally is reducing uh, as people sort of congregate more and more to cities and millennials in in western europe and the us in particular are buying less and less cars yes. so um yeah i think a very very difficult time for uh, but again its products all go into any type of vehicle so right. that's not right of uh, a samvardhana madhusan but you know keep it on the radar per se it's got it's, it's a very complex company as well with so many moving parts Of course. Okay, so from I guess the electrical uh, component makers, let's maybe go to the internal combustion engine component makers, uh, the ones Bosch and Bayer Forge in particular that are very much at risk of this EV revolution. So, what's the outlook on these companies? 
So Bharat Forge, I think, has been a quality player and they have really survived a lot of stress and a lot of, uh, I would say, recessionary trends in the auto industry. They manage pretty well. They're heavily focused on uh, engine parts and forgings for commercial vehicles uh, in India as well as globally. In fact, they supply a lot of uh, forging parts and assemblies for trucks which are manufactured out of US. Mm -hmm. And that was, good, that was a good growth engine for themselves. But having realized that they're too dependent on a single industry, they've tried to diversify into other sectors as well, especially defense, and also oil equipment and other related type of uh, industries where they are supplying their uh, forging, forge parts as well as complete assemblies. Mm -hmm. But despite uh, the kind of quality of management and track record, <coughs> they haven't really been able to make uh, you know kind of a big impact in the last four or five years or so because yeah. of various challenges, COVID, exports, rising steel prices, so these yeah, things but, have you know, I, I look at I look at their numbers, and you know, it's a really uh, it's a really dreary set of numbers because it's not. It doesn't seem like their performance has been bad recently. So just to, I guess set the context. Revenues have only grown at five percent over the last five years, compounded. Uh, but profits have fallen, in fact, by thirteen point two percent year on year over the last five years. And even further back, if we look at the stock's performance over the last seventeen years, they've only grown at seven point five percent compounded which is half the rate of the index. Um, and it would be one thing if they were really cheaply valued, but their P is 58, which is wild. That's what I think, you know, it's a bit of an enigma, but there are very, I would say, quality investors in Bharat Forge, named investors. And it's got a certain fancy in the market with institutional investors. The Kalyanis are very well recognized as a, good quality management with good corporate governance standards. And I think that the potential of the company is there. They have uh, you know, managed many challenges and disruptions within the auto industry and transformed themselves. Mm -hmm. And mind you, this is one auto industry which is also looking at transforming itself to take on the EV evolution as well. Right. So, I mean, I wouldn't want to uh, look at them in that much negative at this point of time. It is a kind of work in progress. But you're right, it is expensive. And there are many headwinds and you know, obviously the preferences for the companies which have done pretty well in the past yeah. few years or so. Yeah. Yes. Then we go to Bosch, I think. Right. So Bosch is the, is the multinational co com uh, company operating in India. And uh, their, their big, uh, I would say, defining factor for themselves is they're a good technology company. You know? mm -hmm. Some of the engine parts which they manufacture, be it spark plugs or be it any of the other powertrain or all, all of mm -hmm. these things, they have a kind of a monopoly, I would say a duopoly, mm -hmm. and they supply those systems to large commercial vehicles, passenger vehicles, and because of that technology, they're able to get a good price as well. Well, I, I'd actually, maybe I'd like to dig into that, right? Like, because if I look at Bosch's numbers over the last five years, again, Revenues have only grown about 4.5%. And profits have, in fact, fallen by 2.2% year on year over the last five years. So, you know, we say they're a monopoly, but monopolies and duopolies generally have strong pricing power, even in times of slow growth. Um, fig figures don't seem to reflect that. So both Bharat Forge and uh, Bosch, they're heavily focused on the commercial vehicle industry. Right. And last four or five years have been the worst ever for the commercial vehicle company, the truck manufacturer, the right. bus manufacturer. But from this point on, I think the commercial vehicle industry from at least post-COVID has started to do exceptionally well because of underinvestment by transport operators mm -hmm. and carriers. So I think that next three, four years would be very good for commercial vehicle companies, which is why even at, these, uh, at this point of time, uh, with these expensive valuation, you may have many analysts very positive on both uh, Bosch as well as Bharat Forge. Actually, both of them have been rated as a hold by analysts. Yes. The reason for that is that we expect commercial vehicle sales to do very well. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think they should be able to grow at a much faster pace over the next four or five years mm -hmm. when they are as against uh, right now. And also a lot of government regulation has come in in terms mm -hmm. of uh, pollution control. And that has certainly benefited Bosch. 
because their mm. content per vehicle is gradually moving up. Right. That's interesting to note. But again, I, I maybe challenge this once again, because if over, over say, a 15, 17 year time span, you go through several economic cycles, you go through a couple of regulatory cycles as well. And Bosch has only returned 11.9% compounded, which is just shy of the index. That's right, Varun. But you know, who knows three years from now, if the stock does well, then this 11% may go to 13, 14%. But these are quality companies and you keep them on the radar. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you feel that there's a kind of inflection point or something which is positive in, and reflected in the numbers, that's time we'll try to start looking at it more seriously. But they're large companies and uh, certainly I think they merit a mention in our uh, podcast. It's just that uh, they have got many challenges and many moving parts, which is why they've underperformed over the last few years or so, but let's not write them off. All right, fair enough. So I guess that that uh, that allows us to move on from you know the core engine part manufacturers for EVs as well as ICs. Let's maybe talk about some truly ancillary products, things like tires and batteries. Maybe we can start with tires because I think batteries is a, is a long discussion to be had there. But tires, uh, Balakrishna Industries and MRF, um, those are the two sort of big names in the space. How are they positioned and, and what's driving them forward? So, Varun, before we go on to tires, I just want to say, I tell our viewers that there are uh, many other companies also in the auto ancillary space. Mm -hmm. It's just that we have covered the companies which we think are the best in terms of track record mm -hmm. and in terms of future positioning. And we've also considered the size aspect. Mm -hmm. But there are many small, mid-sized companies which are uh, doing exceptional work. And they're also focused on this EV mm -hmm. opportunity and also a lot of the ancillaries are looking at exports also big time. So there are right. many, many companies. We don't have the time to cover them. Coming specifically to tires, there's MRF, which is the largest, but there's also SEAT, Apollo tires, right. which have of also course. been uh, very big players over there. So the thing about the tire industry is that there's a good amount of price discipline within the tire industry. And raw material prices generally, I think, impact the financials of these companies. So, and brand also is important. Now, mm -hmm. tires are not your typical auto ancillary because the other auto ancillary company which we discussed, they were focused, 80, 90% revenues were going to the auto OEMs, mm -hmm. like Paruti or Hyundai. Right. When it comes to tires, apart from supplying to the OEM, which is not the most profitable uh, uh, division for them, they have a large replacement market. Right. With the number of trucks going in the country Every few years, you need to change the tires of those trucks or buses or even your PVs, uh, passenger vehicles yeah, or two wheelers yeah. as well. So there were huge replacement market, which is where advertising, brand, distribution comes into play. So you see many uh, tire companies advertising on TV yeah. from that point I of view. I think most famously, MRF and such That's is right. that. I think, exactly. Uh, so that was a really yeah. master stroke on their part. Uh, to make MRF a household name mm -hmm. uh, because of using Sachin as an icon in terms of, uh, you know, and, and more than that, Varun, we have to thank MRF for giving us so many pace bowlers. Yes. So we'll <laughs> certainly, I think we'll every tomorrow. time MRF comes up, you always talk about their investment in fast bowling and, you know, we, right. it's the most important contribution to this country. That's right. And it's got one more um, uh, feather in its cap. It's the first company to reach a single share of one lakh rupees or so. Yeah. So I, there's this whole theory that MRF management has been, uh, say, uh, has never given a bonus because they feel that, uh, you know, if they give a bonus, it's not a good uh, sign or something mm -hmm. like that. So I think for uh, reasons best understood, they have not gone for a bonus issue, a very, very tiny equity. But nonetheless, I think uh, it's been a great value creator of the past. Yeah. Just one thing I wanted to highlight over the last 17 years, 23% compounded, yeah. which is, you know, another one of those blue chip multi baggers. Um, the last five yeah. years haven't been as kind and only 5.8%. And I think that's reflected in their profit figures as well, where the last five years revenue has only grown 7% compounded and profits have fallen 5% year on year. Um, so maybe not, not a great past five years, but I think like you said, that's the CV space not doing particularly well. So well, have you noticed that whether it was the auto OEMs or it was mm -hmm. the auto ancillary, last five years haven't been the best. No. Because two years is COVID. Mm -hmm. Then we had this hike in interest rates mm -hmm. and all these geopolitical events. Before that, there were challenges as far as interest rates were concerned. Right. Government regulations changed on pollution control. 
So there were many, many, I would say, uh, speed breakers for the auto industry per se. Mm -hmm. And that's reflected in these figures. Right. But don't let the last five years fool you. I think the next five years are fantastic for all of the companies we have discussed within right. the auto space. I think that that's maybe why the valuations continue to stay elevated. Exactly. And there's a hope that, you know, as profits recover, those valuations will start to be justified. Absolutely. Absolutely. Coming to MRF and other tire companies, as I said, they have a great replacement market and they are going more and more into radial tires, even at the truck level. So what's radial tires? So radial tires are of a different type. They don't have a tube inside them. So and they are more durable, they are safer mm -hmm. per se, and uh, they give a better grip on the road as well. So from, and, but they're more expensive, of course. So there's this whole radialization also taking place. Uh, of course, today I think most passenger vehicles come with radial tires, but that's not the case with commercial vehicles. But that's the kind of uh, opportunity which these tire companies are pursuing. And by and large, as I said, I think there's good price discipline. And uh, there's a good kind of, uh, I would say, a positioning of all these tire companies. They have a good export market as well, which is why I think, um, you know, they, from time to time, they do tend to surprise us. Yeah. But I want to talk about a very interesting company in the tire space, which is Balakrishna. Right. And I'll tell you why I think it's... So our, just before we before we talk about how and why it's interesting, maybe let's just set the context. Um, again, an outstanding outperformer over the last five years, which we know have been troubled times, revenue has grown at 13.5% compounded. Profits have grown at 6.8% compounded, and it's reflected in the share price. You know, over the last five years, 18% compounded growth yeah. in the share price. I would over say the last the 17 thing. years, 19.8% compounded growth in the share price. So, an absolute multi bagger. Uh, I'd love to know more about you know where they come from and why it is that they're able to outperform so much. So, Balakrishna Tires is a very huge success story out of India, and focused largely on exports. So unlike the other tire manufacturers, MRF, SEAT, uh, Apollo tires, they are focused on off the highway tires, mm -hmm. OHT, off the road tires. So they give tires for agricultural equipment. They give tires for earth movers. They'll give tires for uh, cranes, anything which requires tires, but it is not a passenger vehicle or a two wheeler. Mm -hmm. and the main thing is that they were focused largely on exports. They have taken the India advantage of costs of manufacturing and try to export to very tough markets like Europe and US. Mm -hmm. In Europe, they have had a great success where they are supplied to several OEMs as well. In US is the next focus market for them where they want to start increasing their exposure to the OEMs over there as well. And it has expanded its capacity rapidly. It's the only tire company that I know of which has gone into backward integration and manufactured carbon black as well. Okay. Right, so they've gone into raw materials for tires mm -hmm. and abroad they are focusing on niche segments. Right. And they are the low cost producer because they have got the scale mm -hmm. and they have built a superb distribution system abroad and now they are focusing very much on building their brand BKT in the overseas market by sponsoring many of these sporting events related to automobiles over there. So it's a great, great uh, success story. And uh, investors who invest in Balakrishna have reaped very huge uh, returns on the stock per se. Last three, four years, oil prices going up, raw material prices going up has impacted their performance. Mm -hmm. Last two, three quarters, they've been hit by overstocking in the channel, distribution channel. But I think this is a great long-term story and it's the, the stock is uh, worth tracking, especially when it has got into these sort of challenging positions because eventually I think the economy, the scale will play out and they will be able to grow the export business. Yeah, absolutely. So very interesting story, very, very interesting story. Maybe something for our investors to consider more deeply. Let's move on from tires and let's talk about batteries. Yeah, that's the big <laughs> elephant in the room. You know, that's that's where a lot of the value for automobile manufacturers is going to come going forward uh, is in manufacturing batteries for EVs. But we still have to lead acid battery manufacturers in Exide and Amaraja batteries. Right. So how are they positioned and, and what's the outlook going forward? See, I think the outlook for both these companies is decent. It's just that public and investor perception is that these companies are going to be impacted by the EV revolution, which is right because end of the day, 
lead acid batteries are going to be uh, I would say going to get replaced more and more by lithium batteries uh, going forward or so. Uh, but and investors perceive that to be a kind of a sunset industry, which is why although the numbers may come through, you will find that the valuations are getting compressed for the battery manufacturers. And unfortunately for Excite and Amaraja, you know, they don't have the technology to go very deep into lithium batteries. Of course, Amaraja is setting up a plant. But end of the day, you know, we discussed in the earlier podcast that lithium ion, it's not just the battery, it's actually the cathode and the anode and right. the other chemistry yeah. which goes into so, it. So maybe while we're talking about batteries, let's maybe talk, a, let me maybe take a little bit of a, a minute to explain what the various battery chemistries are, uh, and what the impact of those battery chemistries are. So everyone's heard of lithium ion batteries, right? That's but right. lithium ion batteries break down into three different battery chemistries. So you have lithium, nickel, and cobalt, um, and then you have lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, and then you have lithium iron phosphate. Now, lithium, nickel, cobalt have, are the best performing batteries in terms of energy density, and lithium iron phosphate are the worst performing batteries in terms of energy density. They have some advantages in terms of life, but and cost maybe yes, and cost as well, yeah. Because cobalt is, is very difficult and very expensive to source, and you know it's mostly mostly comes from very dirty mines in Africa. So those are the fundamentally that's the battery chemistry, and all of this where it, where it gets put is it gets put into the cathode. So a battery you know obviously has has a cathode, an anode, and an electrolyte, um, and a, and a separator. And you know the the cathode is uh, this the lithium, nickel, cobalt, or whatever it might be. The anode is very, fairly standardized, graphite or silicon or some combination of the two. The electrolyte is fairly, you know, standardized. So, you so the innovation has to come in the cathode person. Absolutely. And the only people that have the technology to manufacture the best cathodes are the Chinese. Chinese. <laughs> That's yeah. right. That's why I think BYD and the likes of them have a great uh, future yeah, yeah. globally as they go yeah. and take the markets yeah. over there. So let's talk about, you know, I did a bit of digging into exactly what Exide and Amaraja are doing in the uh, in the battery space. So just for some context, um, Exide is investing 6,000 crores in a 12 gigawatt facility over the next eight years. And they hope to be able to produce six gigawatts of battery cells. So just going back to our original battery chemistry example, a cathode, anode, electrolyte, and separator become a battery cell. And you consolidate a lot of battery cells into a battery pack. And the battery pack has some construction, wiring, and software component. Uh, but most of the value is at the, the cathode. But they're not going to the cathode, they're right? Not, so not as Amarada, because these are technologies. There's, a, there's a difference. So Exide is getting to the cell level but the cathode is coming from their Chinese partner, S-Volt. Um, Amaraja is in fact not even going to the cell level, they are sticking at the battery pack level, and they're okay. investing 10,000 crores over 10 years in 16 gigawatts of battery pack manufacturing. So they're fully you know, exposed to any fluctuations in cell price, uh, lithium prices, cathode prices, and they're investing a huge amount of cash, in fact, almost equal to their current market cap on trying to transition from a lead acid battery manufacturer to a lithium ion battery manufacturer. I think that brings in its own risk factors. No? When you make such large investments, when will, the, when will they start to return profitability on it? And there are technology risks, there are execution risks. Of course. So of course. I would say that battery manufacturers uh, are a bit of a challenging spot. Yeah. And from an investment perspective, you know, you may kind of kind of avoid them. Yeah. Because of the kind of uh, problems uh, and the way the trends are happening yeah. in the auto industry. So another two really interesting pieces of information. So, um, you know, we heard a while back about India's huge lithium reserves in Kashmir. Yeah. Right? That was everywhere. Absolutely. And I think on that news, a lot of the battery manufacturers perked up. But I dug into that a little bit deeper. And it turns out the only thing that's happened is we've cleared one phase of exploration to identify that there may be lithium reserves up to a quantity of 5.9 million tons. For that lithium to get extracted, for extraction to start, we are easily at least a decade away. Oh. Yeah. Then what are we so positive about that news? I mean, so yeah, we're yeah. still going to be dependent on Chinese. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole thing, because we've just completed one phase of exploration. There's another two phases of exploration before we can even start constructing the mines. 
So there's a long, long time before this lithium production comes online and actually has any impact on, you know, the domestic battery industry. Yeah, well, interesting fact, when I did not know that, I yeah. was just positive that now hopefully we'll get self-sufficient no. lithium, but that doesn't seem to be so. Not at and all. And that's, I think, the, the weak spot in the entire EV space is the, our dependence on China. Yeah. And it's a global dependence on China for this Okay, thing. all right. So then that in itself, I think, is going to be a bit of a challenge for the auto industry. We don't want another OPEC, do we? <laughs> no, 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 yeah. no. But, you know, um, I think it's a little bit different because oil you're continuously relying on. Right. Right. Lithium, once you have it, you can recycle that battery. You can continue to use it. So you can't expand your capacity. But for example, if an ICE car doesn't get oil, it's a wasted asset. If you don't get more lithium, you just can't produce more EVs. You're a little stuck, That's right. but it's not like everything's going to shut down. Interesting. Aspect. Yeah. And another really negative factor for XR and Amaraj, just, sorry, just bringing us back to the point. So. India is looking for about 50 gigawatts of battery manufacturing capacity. And the government has committed 38,000 crores through the PLI scheme. Okay. And they recently awarded 18,000 crores or so to three advanced cell chemistry battery manufacturers. Um, would you like to guess which which three? I have no idea. Yeah. Which so, well, just, just as a heads up, neither Excite nor Amaraj are, are in that. Okay. So uh, That's not good news That's for not at all good news. But the three that are in are Reliance New Energies, unsurprisingly, Ola Electric, okay. and Rajesh Exports. Wow. And Ola Electric, as a matter of fact, has just started construction on a 5 gigawatt cell manufacturing plant. So they're going all the way into All the, the way down. I think that's an exciting times for the auto ancillary in the auto industry per se. And I think that we'll find many winners over the next decade or so. Yeah. And investors just need to have an eye on uh, which companies are doing something different. Yeah. And what is that technology barrier which they have pierced mm -hmm. to try and grow the business. Yeah. So I think uh, in one of our earlier podcasts, we talked about it being a stock picker's market. And uh, this is truly a stock picker's space, I'd say. Exactly. I think uh, you cannot paint all, paint all auto ancillary with a single brush. There are going to be some which are very different in terms of their products, position, and in terms of the markets which they supply to. So I think uh, you would have many winners over here, but there are many minefields as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So a lot for uh, viewers to consider uh, in selecting the right stocks. Hopefully it gives them an incentive to continue tuning in and, and listen yeah. to our analysis. So like, I just want to end with our usual disclosure that we just discussed these stocks uh, they're not recommendations to any of our viewers and we and our clients may have been invested in them. All right. Well, I think on that note, um, I'd like to thank you for tuning into the 12th episode of uh, the Indian Market Story. And uh, hopefully, you know, we've given you a, a quick overview of, you know, what the various options are in the auto, auto ancillary space. And uh, hopefully you're able to combine it with the knowledge you've gained from the two-wheeler podcast as well as the passenger vehicle podcast. Uh, and uh, please keep tuning back in. And we'll keep you updated on in where to allocate your investments uh, within the auto space.